I hope everybody's having a blast evening today. We're going to have a good time. I want to go over and sh show you what's the difference from the Old Testament prayer to a New Testament prayer. What is the difference? And I'm gonna, first going to show you some prayers from the Old Testament, how they worked, and how New Testament prayers are, are different and why they are different. And if I ask you, how are you all doing today? H how was your day? Most of us, have you, did we have a good day? Yes. Very often when a person asks you, how are you doing? We would say good under the circumstances. I want to get your Bibles. Look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. I find that so amazing. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. So God wants you to be the head, not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, only above, not underneath. If thou hearken unto the com commands of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe to the, and to do them. Okay, what if we would write underneath here, what comes underneath our circumstances? Can you name, name something? Let's make a list. Under what circumstances? A hurricane? <laughs> Just like... Okay, if you had a hurricane, how many of us have spiritual hurricanes in our lives? I think all of us. And we don't have to be underneath here, we can be uh, above. Earthquake. Somebody dying in your family. What comes all underneath the circumstances that we live under today? Yeah, restric restrictions. They could wear us down if we, if we want to. I was at two restaurants today and asked for a vaccine passport. And it says it's your loss, not mine. I fasted before. Doesn't make me sad. Restrictions. What's, what's one more thing? What, what, we have lots of things under the circumstances. What kind of problems do we have that Satan is throwing our way? Pain. Huh? Pain, Pain yeah. Death. Huh? Death, yeah. You already have it here. Oh, yeah, death, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a big one. Anything else? Fear. 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 Something else? There's a lot more to, to add to that. Rejection. Okay, thank you. Now we have a list already we can, that we can see. We can be underneath one of these circumstances. And I'm sure if you're in here or you're, you're watching this, you have one of these circumstances in your life. And if somebody says, I'm doing good under the circumstances, then I'm at, I'm at, I have a question. How come you're under them? How come you're not above them? Whatever Satan throws my way, I refuse to go underneath that what he has. Because as soon as I go underneath that thing, that's where he gets me. And if the Bible says, we can be the head and not the tail. And above only, not beneath, above only. So that's my decision. And I believe God wants to say it right to you that are in here. And whoever's watching or listening this. He wants to tell you. You're the head, not the tail. You should be above only, not beneath. Why would we go 
underneath the, the umbrella of what Satan throws our way. Let's get out of here. In the name of Jesus. Let's don't, that, that, let's don't dwell on this. Dwell on what we have. Hang, that's a Bible verse that we should hang on to. We should cling to. Deuteronomy 28, 13. Get that, get that in your heart, head and in your heart. And make that your own. Like God is telling you exactly. That's your revelation. Not because I said it, but because the Bible says it. I think we as Christians, and I will, and I already have apologized to the devil. You will probably say, I will never do that. I have apologized to the devil. There's so many things that the devil does today in Christian's life, especially in religious people, and they will blame Jesus for it. I heard a testimony. There was a mother and a daughter in Texas. They were abducted by a murderer. They were both being raped. And they had to lay down, face, face down, and the murderer shot them in the back of their head. The daughter died, and the mother survived. And later I heard her testimony. And she says, God allowed it. What a God do you serve if he allows that? He said, God got the glory out of it. What glory do you see in that? What, what glory do you see in two ladies being kidnapped, being raped, and being shot in the back of their heads? Is there any glory in it? Absolutely not. And this mother, she said, she blamed all on Jesus, that Jesus allowed it, and she was so thankful. I remember when my wife died. I cannot tell you what all hit me. And I rejected fear, doubt, unbelief, whatever. I was busy rejecting it. I said, Jesus, I don't care what people say. I don't care what's going to happen. I will not blame you for this. You didn't do this. Her time was not up. And you wouldn't almost... 90% of the people that I met the month after that says God had numbered her days. That is stupid. Why do you think God would plan to kill somebody or murder somebody? God has given people a free choice. He has given us a free choice. We can believe whatever we want. We can be, decide to be an atheist. Or I can decide to be a follower of Jesus. He gives us free choice going to hell or going to heaven. It's your, your decision to make. It's not God's decision to make. God will not make that decision for you. You have to make that decision. And I remember it was the day after my wife died, we were invited to a church to build a bunch of people there and they were giving us supper and we were singing there and... A, I was just weeping, sitting flat on the floor. People were singing. I can't even tell you what I felt like. There's no words to it. And then I heard a pastor going up and says, John, you'll have to agree with Job today. The Lord has given you your wife. And I stopped them right there. I says, hold it, hold it, hold it. And there's witnesses in here that were sitting right there. And I says, can I come up there? I sat from on the floor sitting and crying. I was to make sure nobody would blame Jesus for killing my wife. And he wanted to say that the Lord has given her to you and he had taken her from you. And he allowed me. This was a super religious church. I had started that church before and I had been kicked out before. Now they invited us back when my wife was dead. But anyways, I was up there. I was preaching to those people. And I said to those people, whoever says amen to what I'm saying, stand. Do you remember how many times those people stood in church and agreed with me? Many times. It says Job was silly. He just lost all of his wealth, all of his children. And he was talking something. Later, he, he repented for what he said. So Job was blaming God 
for what the devil did. We read in, in Job chapter 1 that the, the, the devil got permission from God to go do that, to, to go and do that. Now, today, people still use Job. Like religious people on a funeral, you will always hear Job's pre the preaching of Job. Makes me so sick. But that was one time the Lord gave me strength and the Lord told me to go up and I, I preached to all those people. Yeah, when my wife was being killed yesterday. I have decided not to be underneath the circumstances. It took me, it was a seven hour drive and it took us, somebody drove me back and it took us five hour, a five hour drive back. On the way back, I says, Jesus, I know this is not you. I'm not going to blame you for this. No matter what people say, no matter what it is, I will not blame you for this. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the people that did this. But I'm not mad at Jesus. And I decided not to go under the circumstances. I, I, I turned my phone on and, and I raised a hallelujah. It was a fairly new song, song at that time and I had that on. I, I don't know how many times over I listened to that. It was very hard. And Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. John 14. It says, and some, at times it felt like my heart was coming out of my chest. And I asked the driver to stop. And I ran away from the vehicle. And I started speaking to my heart. I said, heart, you're not getting out of my body. And I get you under control. And I'm not going to let you to be troubled. I'm on my way, way, way back. And I need to see my kids. It was a battle going on within me, but we should not get underneath the circumstances. Who can say, me now, on top of the circumstances? Can we say that from the, from the heart? No matter what kind of a hurricane we had today? I could tell you some hurricanes I had this week. I could be way underneath here. My feelings this morning, they, they, they told me that I had a train wreck, and I told my feelings, you're wrong, you're lying. I have decided to be here. Can you tell your feelings you're lying? How often do we do that? Do we ever do that? Do we ever tell our feelings you're lying? I'm not a train wreck. I'm above. Because the Bible says so. And I have gotten this Bible verse. And I, I hang on to this Bible verse. And if we go to the next two chapters. Moses says, I have cho you will be blessed going out, blessed coming in, blessed going to the fields, blessed wherever you do. And he says, and you can choose life or curses. And he says, I choose life. And then he uh, gives us advice. Choose, choose life. I have chosen life no matter what. The devil has not enough demons to bring me down. If, if it hairlips every demon on, in hell, and God tells me what to do, I will still go do it. I don't care what it is. We should live under this umbrella. Once we live here, life is getting a lot easier. And can we see why we should apologize to the devil for what we... A lot of things that the devil throws our way and it throws in a, Christian, in a Christian's life, a Christian will blame that on God. And that is not... If they look at the God of the Old Testament, if you look, just look at the God of the Old Testament, yeah, yeah that would be him. But we have... Jesus now. In the Old Testament, they had Moses as intercessors. They had Abraham. They had David. They have Samuel. They have Solomon. And we have something much better. We have Jesus. And we will see that today. If you read 2 Kings chapter 1, starting at verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 1. Starting at verse 9, we see how Elijah called fire out of heaven to kill people. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him. And behold, he sat on top of the hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God. Thou man of God, the king had said, said, come down. And Elijah answered and said unto to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, 
Then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. So 51 people. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he's, he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto them, O man of God, thus hath said the king, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So this was Old Testament. Elijah knew he was in trouble if he was going to go to the king. And he called fire from heaven. And, and I thought, when, when I was a religious person, I found out about it. I thought, this is amazing. Elijah can do this. We can do this too. And yet, I had read in the New Testament, whatever you will ask, you will get. I have stood against people and called fire from heaven to kill this people, this person and stuff. It never worked. I truly believed. In my, eye, I, in my eyes and my heart, I could, see, right, this, I could see this person falling over and being dead. I've done that multiple times. That person never died. Is that a way we should pray today? Elijah did. I thought, well, this is awesome. I could do it too. Verse 13 said, and he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. And, he third, and the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life, let my life and the life of these 50, thy servants, be precious in thy sight. Can we see how differently this guy came? He acknowledged the man of God. And if you look back, even Jesus' apostles were trying to pray this way. They asked for permission. Let's go to Luke uh, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 54 to 56. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. And they went, and they went to another village. So Jesus rebuked that prayer that Elijah prayed out there. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy these people. I came to help these people. For these people to have life. If you turn to Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 17. Genesis chapter 18. Starting in verse 16. Here we see, and the man rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. It talks about the angels that went to Sodom and Gomorrah. That, Lot should, that, that should talk to Lot and his wife. And I will just break into portions of this because it's a long chapter here. Verse 18 says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. God, that's what God speaks to him. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed within him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. To do justice and judgment, that the Lord may, Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And if you go over to, to verse, verse 23, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy? God is telling him how he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason, we, I think we all know why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was because of homosexuality. 
I think that it leaves us a very good example how much God supports that, that system. He burnt those two cities. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preadventure, there may there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare that place for the 50 righteous that are therein? Can we see Abraham thought there was at least 50 righteous people in that city? And he goes on and on and on. He goes down to five. And God says, I will not do it for five. And verse 33 says, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. As soon as he had stopped talking to Abraham, the Lord went on his way. Abraham was interceding for these people. Can we see where he stopped? That's where God could do his anger. If Abraham had kept, kept standing, God have, could have never done it. Because God had chosen Abraham to intercede for these people. To be the mediator for these people. But now Abraham, he, he was sure there, was, there must be five. There was only one, we read in, in Second Peter, there was only one, just Lot. His wife died the next morning. And his daughters had all sorts of crazy things. That I'm not going to get off on that. If we go Exodus chapter 32. We see another example from Moses. I talked about it last time a little bit already. I'm just going to read some verses again just to show you how Moses was praying. And I've been a school teacher for many, many years. And I've, the, the Old Testament, those stories, they were my favorites. I knew a lot of them off by heart. I loved them. But I was very religious. And I was trying to do everything these Old Testament people were doing. And did you know that's Antichrist? Did you know that's Antichrist? That's doing something that's against Jesus. If you and I pray today, the way Abraham, David, Moses, all these people prayed, that is Antichrist. That's going against Jesus. Because these people never had Jesus. David says, renew the spirit within me. David couldn't get born again like we can, do, like we can today. Because Jesus hadn't paid for, for sins yet. They had to offer everything for, every year for all their sins. He could not get born again. That was all right for David to pray that way because they didn't have Jesus. Jesus had not died on the, sin, uh, on the cross yet. And when we look at th this story here of Moses, is almost like a man in a life you will hear. We all know that the burning bush, God called Moses, go, lead, go tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh to let my people go. That's what God says to Moses. And now look what he says here. It's, this is still the same God. And you will actually think, this can't be happening. This is not true. Genesis 32 verse 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. He was on the mountain where he received the Ten Commandments. For thy people. Can you see? Before... God told Moses, these are my people. Let, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now he says, your people. Isn't that like a, a husband and a wife and the kid wins, wins the, the award? The husband says, did you see what my kid got? Or did you see what my son got? And he messes up and you look at your wife and says, look what your son did. Isn't it almost like that? I find that I, I have no room in my head to just comprehend how, how Moses and God had, this, did have, had an open relationship. Can we see that? Totally open. It says, God says, For thy people, which thou hast brought, brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. 
they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made him a, a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy goals, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, this is a stiff-necked people. God says this is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. Can we see? God says to Moses, leave me alone. Because God knew if Moses was not going to leave him alone, he could not do what he was going to do. And let, he says, let me alone, that my rat may wax hot. He says to Moses, leave me alone so I can get really mad. I'm going to bring the fire. That my rat may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. See, God says, I will consume these people. Let's see what Moses says. He's coming against God now. He says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why do it thy rat wax hot against Thy people. Now Moses turns back to God says, Thy people, it's your people, are not mine. He turns against them. Which thou hast brought forth from the land of Egypt. And he says, you've brought them forth. So it's not me. With a great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for, for mischief, did he bring them out? To slay them in the, in the mountains. And to consume them from the face of the earth. Moses says to God, you will ruin your reputation. You did all these miracles to the Egyptians. It's not, now Pharaoh will hear about what you're doing here and he will think you're crazy. He says, why would you do that? Do we ever talk to God like that? We shouldn't today, but I cannot believe this is, this is happening. But it says right in the Bible. And then he says, turn from thy fears, rat, and repent of this evil. Moses said to God, repent. Repent of the evil thing that you're trying to do. This is Mo these are Mo Moses' words to God. That's how he speaks to God. He says, repent. We would normally say to people, repent. And Moses says to God, repent. But Moses was standing between the people. Who knows what a mediator is? Can we display something a little bit for a mediator? I don't know what your name is. Could you come stand here and fight with me? And you come and be our mediator between us? Just so people can see what, what it is. Yeah, you can be there and... Hey, why did you lie about me? You told a bunch of stories about me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you, do you need to be a mediator? I, I, I don't think he told you any stories about you. So. Yeah, he's the innocent. <laughs> do you see what the mediator does? He, he stabs them between us. Yeah. He's a, pe yeah. Yeah. He's Here a peacemaker. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so we, we cannot fight now because we have a mediator. He's, he's protecting both of us. He's not against one or the other. He's, he's protecting us. And that's what, what Moses, exactly, that was the, the Israelites, and that was God, and this is uh, Moses. You were Moses in between here. Yeah. That, that's how, how, how Moses fought the battle, and he stood against them. And God could not take that away from Moses because he had chosen Moses for this thing. If God would have taken that away from Moses, God would have not been God anymore. He, he couldn't take that away from Moses. Even as mad as he got, but he, had, he kept his promise. Thank you very much. Yeah. And now Moses tells him to repent from the evil thing that he wants to do. Verse 13 says, Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, 
and said unto them, I will multiply your seeds and the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seeds and I shall inherit it forever. So Moses reminds God, what did you, you make promises? Why wouldn't you keep these promises? He says, and the Lord repent of the evil which he taught, of, taught to do unto his people. Can we see? Moses stepped in between. How many of you really believe that God repented? You probably see that in your Bible right now. But do you believe it in your heart too that he did? But I heard this story for the first time. I heard it on a truck. I have my daughter with me and we were listening to the radio. And she says, that is a funny story. I says, if it wasn't so sad, it would be fun. It would be funny. But it's a, it's a very sad background from it. But now we see how Abraham, David, Moses, and all these people inter interceded for their people, right? As a mediator. Let's go see what the New Testament says about, about our mediator. First Timothy 2, verse 1 to 5. We see how those people prayed, and here Paul teaches us how, how, how we should pray. He says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks to made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will give all men to be who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, between just what we had here between God and man, there's only one mediator. And it says, the man Christ Jesus. So, when Jesus died on the cross, how many of you have felt rotten about things that you've done? Just felt very bad about it? How many have? Lots of us. We should. We should feel rotten about the things. And I have preached out of the Old Testament. Sin separates you from God. That's why God, that's why God does not answer your, prayer, your prayers. Have you ever heard that? That was the Old Testament. God has no wrath towards me. He's not putting a plague on me to teach me something. He's not making me sick to teach me something. I've heard so many people when they got sick, says God wants to teach me something through this. That's not, that's, that's not the God that we have today. In the Old Testament, it was that way. God was, got angry at people and he punished them. But the New Testament, he sent Jesus. And all the angerness that God ever had towards you and to any sins, any sin that's ever come to this earth, you take whatever you want, homosexuality or whatever it is. Jesus took that punishment. Jesus took that punishment on the cross. God is no longer mad at you. And there's only one sin that will bring us to, have, will bring us to hell. It's not a, being a murderer. It's not being a thief. It's not being a drunkard. It's not going to be a drug addict. All these sins are not bringing us, bringing us to, to hell. Because Jesus has paid for them all. Because if you come underneath here, Jesus has paid for all of them. The sin that will bring you to hell is John 16, verse 9, where it says, not believing in Jesus. And very few people allow the Bible to interfere with their own thinking. For whatever we think is more important than what the Bible says. Okay, if I am under here now, can I go live in sin? If I live in sin, what does that do? That opens the door for the devil. I have 
preached, if God is not going to judge this earth very soon, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I have been preaching this. But the revelation I see today, if God would still judge us that have Jesus, he would have to apologize to Jesus. If I pray the way Moses did or David did, that is a slap on the face to Jesus because Jesus came and now he's inter interceding, not a person anymore. Now I don't have, like when we grew up, who has learned you have to go and confess all your sins to a pastor? A lot of us have done that. How many sins can a pastor or a bishop forgive? Just absolutely none. But if you come to Jesus, and if, if, he, if he goes sin, we open the door to the, to, for the devil. Who has heard of 9-11? I think we all know about that, and, and I don't know if you were all alive, but I, for sure you were not all alive at that time. But what were the, the Christians saying at that time? God is punishing America because of what? Taking this Bible out of school, taking prayer out of school. God is punishing them. That's what the religious people were saying. That is a lie. If you take prayer out of your life, that opens the door to the devil. The devil can come, come, come and destroy you. If you stop re reading the Bible, that, that's opening the door for the devil. The, the devil can come and destroy you, can harm you. In 2006, in March, I will never forget, there was a, a small armor school in Pennsylvania. I don't know how many of you know the story. The milkman went to that school, told all the boys to leave. Just the teachers, the late, were all ladies, and I know a person personally from this school. And the girls he kept inside. And he had two by fours and he nailed the doors shut. What did he do? The girls were standing against the wall and begging this guy to shoot him first. And this, this guy lifted his gun and started shooting these teachers and the girls. Didn't he shoot 11 of them? One teacher had managed to escape. And they don't have phones. At that time, at that time there was no cell phones, but maybe there were, but the, those people don't have cell phones anyway, even today. And she had called the cops. And, be, and there were 17 people in there, and uh, I'm sure she, he shot 11. But at the time the cops got there, and he shot himself. And I went and talked to these Amish people, and they says, we, we know, we know why, this, why this happened. God is punishing us. It says, how come in such a dramatic way? These seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old girls they didn't have nothing to do with this. Yeah, but he says, we allowed women to teach in our school. And God showed us that we were wrong. So we have to put men back in school. At that time, yeah, I, I was right there. I was right with them. Yep, you got a great revelation. And I, I went to my church and I, I teach the same thing. Like I did in school too. Like, but no, we wouldn't hire a lady for, for school teacher. We didn't want any man come through us all. That was me. But that's when I was on this side. When I was religious. I was living for what this side had. I didn't, I didn't come to what this side had. God didn't punish those people, but there again, they blamed. They blamed Jesus for what the devil did. And that's why I say we should, I think a lot of people will have to apologize to the devil for what we all, set, we set the devil free and blame Jesus for it. It's wrong. You might ask, how do we pray under here? There's, if you go get living under, under here, most people don't. They will, they, here, you should never be on top. But most people, they, they, they live on top and look back that way if they, if they ever came to this side. Like, if you, we look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's just one, one page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And for most people, that's just one blank page. It's a huge difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a huge difference. And we should, because there they didn't have Jesus, we have Jesus. We should live underneath here. We should make it a, a daily choice that we will live here. That we will not just on Sunday morning and we will come here. We should day and night, we should sleep here, we, we should dwell here. Psalms 91 says if we come under, under the umbrella, what we will all be protected from. If I, if I choose to live in sin, I open the, the door for the, the devil and the devil can throw in my, uh, into me whatever he wants to. 
I give the devil legal access to my body if I open up to sin. And here I pray. I go pray for people. Sometimes I pray for a person, nothing happens. What, I, what do they do? And some people say, hey, hey what, what's going if you want to pray for me, nothing happens. What, 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 what is that? I said, that's the worst that can happen. There's nothing. I'm not blaming Jesus for, not, for there has not, nothing been happening. I said, Jesus, okay. I need a revelation. I start praying in tongues. I said, Jesus, tell me. Tell me. I need an answer. I need a revelation. I know, I, I know you've given this to me already. I don't have to beg for strength. I don't have to beg for help. I, the only help I, need, I, I requested, Jesus, show me. Jesus, show me. And my, my, my problems, uh, if I stay underneath here, my problems get very small. The biggest problem that Satan throws, throws my way gets very small underneath here. I want to show us one prayer. Sorry for going so long. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And I promise I'm going to stop after that. Ephesians 3. Starting at verse 14, we can see how Paul prayed. And these prayers are almost too simple for, for a religious person to pray it this way. But this prayer is so powerful and there's so much in it. We say, for this cause I bow my knees, Paul says, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is, is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might and, and his spirit in the inner man. See, in the inner man, he's asking this for. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints that is the breadth and the length breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we've asked or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church but in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen is he begging for begging for something and Jesus says he has given us authority to stand over the evil forces. We should just command. If something comes into my body, we should learn how to command that thing to, to get out of there. I have a hard time not going to, to different scriptures, but I promise I will start out. <laughs> but if anything comes into your body, speak to it. Don't speak to Jesus about your problem. Speak to your problem about Jesus. That makes all the difference. Speaking to your problems about Jesus scares your problem away. Makes your, your problem run. And we, sh we should learn our bodies how to do that. We already know in our mind how to do it. It's a process. If you're not there yet, I say I have not arrived, but I have laughed. I have laughed. And the process I've been going through, some, some are harder than others. But once my heart gets it, Jesus has it. Or my body, body understands. My, our bodies are trying, is trying to tell us, hey, I won't, I won't make this. I won't make this. Teach your body. When you raise your, your voice and mix it with faith, that your body will be obedient. It works. In Jesus' name. Be blessed. Thank you very much for your time.